Hello again, this is Frank Gaylard from Radiopedia.org and today we're going to be discussing imaging of acute ischemic stroke. In most instances, cerebral ischemia results from a thromboembolism, either from the heart or from the carotids. Rarely it is also due from paradoxical emboli through the patent foramen ovale or from aortic atherosclerotic disease. This is seen most commonly in the setting of either angiography or cardiac surgery. In situ thrombosis within the cerebral circulation is seen either superimposed on a pre-existing arteriosclerotic disease or in the setting of arterial dissection. Imaging of acute stroke is performed either with CT or MRI. The majority of imaging of acute strokes is performed with CT, although MRI is in fact more sensitive. The reason for this is mainly to do with availability of MRI and the ability to get a patient in and out of the CT scanner rapidly without the concern for MRI compatible resuscitation equipment. The mainstay of imaging of acute ischemic stroke is with a non-contrast brain, although increasingly in the setting of ischemic strokes this is being supplemented with CT angiography and CT perfusion. Let's focus on the hyperacute findings in ischemic stroke. This can be divided into two main sections. One is direct visualization of the clot or embolism, and this can be seen immediately, or early parenchymal changes, which can be seen as early as within one hour of onset of symptoms. The hyperdense artery is a well-known sign on non-contrast CT scanning and represents direct visualization of the clot within the lumen of the occluded artery. It relies on the fact that clot is hyperdense when compared to normal flowing blood. However, this depends on the age of the thromboembolism. Flowing blood typically has a density of approximately 40 Hounsfield units, although this varies depending on the hematocrit and state of hydration. Acute thrombus is not significantly denser than this. However, with time, it becomes progressively more hyperdense, reaching densities of up to 100 Hounsfield units. Fortunately, the majority of ischemic strokes are due to thromboembolism, which is caused by clot forming either in the carotids or within the heart. As such, the clot that eventually embolizes and occludes intracranial circulation has been present for some time and is significantly hyperdense. In this case, we can see the right M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery is much denser than any of the other arteries are seen. In this second case, thromboembolism has occurred to the top of the basilar artery, which is much more dense than the internal carotid arteries at the same level. We can confirm direct visualization of the clot by performing CT angiography, which allows segment, which appears hyperdense on non-contrast imaging, to appear as hypo-enhancement or a filling defect on CT angiography. The same direct visualization can be seen on catheter angiography, in this case, the M1 segment is occluded and we can see collateral flow across from the anterior cerebral circulation to supply part at least of the middle cerebral artery territory. The two regions that are affected most profoundly in acute occlusion of the supraclinoid internal carotid artery, usually the M1 segment, are the basal ganglia, particularly the caudate head and the lentiform nucleus, and the insular cortex. The basal ganglia are supplied by lenticulostriate perforating arteries, which are end arteries, and such no collateral circulation is available to them. The insular cortex, although capable of receiving collateral circulation, is the most distant part of the cortex from the anterior cerebral or posterior cerebral artery. When ischemic, grey matter becomes hypodense and the grey-white matter differentiation becomes lost. This can be seen as early as within one hour of occlusion, and in up to 70% of patients is seen within three hours. The rest of the cortex, because of the collateral circulation, tends to be more delayed in demonstrating changes on CT. In this case, we can see a hyperdense middle cerebral artery with vague hypodensity of the surrounding cortex of the temporal pole. This is a little more pronounced on the slice more superior where there is blurring of the lentiform nucleus and loss of the grey-white matter differentiation of the insular cortex. This is difficult to appreciate on standard windowing of non-contrast CT but can be made more conspicuous by narrowing the window. 
Here we can see loss of the grey white matter differentiation, particularly affecting the insular cortex. This is nonetheless subtle, but is worth seeking, as in many cases the hyperdense artery will not be visible, and this may be the only sign available to confirm the presence of an acute infarct. In this case, CT perfusion was performed, which demonstrates prolongation of a Tmax and mean transit time, but no significant difference in cerebral blood volume or cerebral blood flow. The region of ischemic penumbra, which is the area which has not infarcted and is potentially salvageable by reperfusion, on CT perfusion is taken to be the mismatch between cerebral blood flow and prolongation of Tmax, in this case uh, shaded in, in green. This patient went on to have an attempted clot retrieval, which unfortunately was unsuccessful. A scan performed a few days later confirms evolution of the middle cerebral artery territory infarct. MRI is extremely sensitive to acute ischemia, with changes seen on diffusion-weighted imaging and apparent diffusion coefficient maps seen within a few minutes of onset. These appear as bright areas on diffusion and dark areas on ADC maps. As mentioned before, MRI is usually not used in the very acute setting as it imposes too great a delay in attempting to treat the patient either with intravenous thrombolysis or intraarterial thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy. In summary, the imaging of acute cerebral ischemia revolves around either detecting the clot or detecting early parenchymal changes. This is most commonly done with CT, but can also be performed with MRI if available. More information and many additional cases are available, of course, on radiopedia.org. Make sure you check out the other episodes in this series on imaging of stroke. See you next time. Yeah.